Hey, it's Laura Reagan from Therapy Chat Podcast and Trauma Chat Podcast and Trauma Therapist Network. Coming here to let you know that if you're a trauma therapist or a therapist who works with clients who have trauma, even if you don't identify as a trauma therapist, you don't have any certifications, you may not have had formal training in trauma therapy, but you use a trauma-focused approach in your work, then I want you to know that Trauma Therapist Network membership is open now for new members. Early access is for people who are on the waiting list and you can join the waiting list now and we'll send you the registration link so you can join at a discounted rate between now and June 19th, 2023. We will be offering a discounted rate that you'll keep for the lifetime of your membership and you can cancel at any time. On the 20th, we're opening up registration to everyone and there will be a discount on your first month, but it's not the same low rate that you will get if you join now. So if this, this is something you've been waiting for, if you need support, you want connection, you enjoy case consultation, you want to learn cutting age neuroscience informed approaches to working with attachment, trauma, and dissociation, then Trauma Therapist Network is a place for you and we would love to welcome you in. There's three tiers of membership. You can learn all about it by going to go.traumatherapistnetwork.com slash join. That will take you to the waiting list. And from there, you can sign up for the waiting list and you'll receive an email with the link to register and that discount code. I hope to see you in the community. I love cooking, but I often find that by the end of the workday, I draw a blank when thinking about what to make for dinner. That's why I love HelloFresh. They have a variety of interesting recipes, so I'm not eating the same thing week after week because I can't think of anything new to cook. HelloFresh cares about quality. That's why their seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness and travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. And they do more than just delicious dinners. Not only can you take your pick from 40 weekly recipes, but you can choose from over 100 items to round out your order, from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything arrives in one box on a delivery day you choose, and you can try it for free. Go to hellofresh.com slash chat 16 and use code chat 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash chat 16. When you use code chat 16, you can get 16 free meals plus free shipping. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 386. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. Today, I'm bringing you a conversation that was recorded more than six months ago. So thank you, Annie, my guest, for your patience. A lot's been happening in the early part of this year that didn't go as expected, and that's life. So I usually have a little bit less lag time between our recordings and releasing the episode. But this time, what we're talking about is still extremely timely and maybe even more so than it was when we recorded. So we'll start off by telling you about who my guest is today and then what we talked about. My guest is 
Annie Schusler, who is a business coach and the host of the podcast Rebel Therapist, where she shares stories of people creating unique and innovative businesses. Annie was a therapist in private practice for 20 years and a business coach for over 10 years. Her mission is to help people trained as therapists create and launch exceptional programs beyond the therapy room. She lives in San Francisco with her spouse and two children, and when she's not recording a podcast or working with her clients, you can find her trying to convince her family to play Catan with her or watering one of 75 houseplants. You can find her resources at rebeltherapist.me. So Annie is someone who many therapist friends had been telling me I should meet for years, and she tried to make it happen, but I struggle with email and just completely dropped the ball a couple times. But I'm really grateful that we finally connected because I really appreciate her presence and the way she is showing up in the world. And in the space I was in when we recorded this interview, I was I was dealing with a lot of trauma and grief at the time. And that was before my recent death in the family. So that's how it goes. Anyway, the reason why I feel like this is so timely now is that here in June 2023, more than three years after the pandemic that affected the whole world landed in my area in of March of 2020, more than three years later, I'm witnessing, observing people I know leaving the field. So one example is a friend of a friend. I don't know her well, but someone who I've watched through social media over the years that I've known her as my friend's friend, probably about 15 years I've known her. I watched her change careers from a career in finance to deciding to go back to school and become a nurse, followed by becoming a nurse practitioner out of a desire to have meaningful work and help people. She became an intensive care nurse. So you might guess where I'm going with this. She was in the thick of it during the pandemic, working clinically as an intensive care nurse. And just recently, she left nursing. She left her job and she talked about how broken the systems are and how devastating beyond words it was to do the work she was doing during the pandemic. And it's hard work to be a nurse or any position where you are a witness to people's crisis and pain at any point. But during the pandemic, we all have heard how healthcare workers have been affected. In fact, there's been a lot of media exposure to how physicians, nurses have been directly affected during the years 2020 through, say, 2022, when things were the most intense with the the hospitalizations. We don't hear as much about how therapists are affected, but a therapist I know who is someone who um, I used to provide consultation to, someone I know is deeply passionate about their work, who I've spent time in circles with, retreating with over the years, someone I have a lot of respect for, and I know that they were doing a lot of good in the world, had their practice for more than 10 years. They left the field, and I think they're still offering some coaching, but this is two people who were bright sparks in their work, extremely intelligent, dedicated, committed people who the stress of the past few years just was too much. And they said, you know what? I don't have to do this. This is a job and I don't have to sacrifice myself in this way. So as as deeply as I respect that perspective, it's really not good for our culture that people who want to help and are extremely committed to helping and people who are direct clinical workers who have the potential to rise to leadership positions and teach so many more people and reach so many more people leave the field. I don't blame them one bit. Your mental health comes first. Your physical health comes first. You have to put yourself first. No one else can put you first. You have to do it. So much respect for both of them and 
absolute 100% support for their choices. But this is a big deal. I mean, that's just two people. I know another person who I've witnessed come into the field as a therapist and deeply passionate about the work. And over the course of those, the past three years, the exposure and the stress and the, the experiences that they were going through in their own life while supporting clients going through the same types of experiences, they left clinical work completely. They're taking an extended leave of absence. And when they come back, they're not returning to clinical work because it's taking too much from them. So while I think this happens all the time in all, in all points of our profession, people leave because the stress is too much. But I think right now we're losing a lot of extremely committed, some seasoned, some newer people faster than we can replace them. And of course, no one's replaceable, but I mean in, in work. Because, you know, what this means is when we know that people are out there seeking help more than ever, thanks to a lot of positive work to destigmatize mental health treatment, at the same time, people can't get in for appointments with client, with therapists and practices are being sold. So there's a lot shifting in the helping professions right now. I think we all need to know that and be aware of it. And for one, it's a cautionary tale that we can't, no one can sustain an extended, intense level of stress permanently. It's just, it becomes too much. Either our physical health or our mental health or both will be impacted. And so we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves. And I'm not doing the practice self-care shame message. That's not my point. My point is we are the only ones who can do this for ourselves. And if you're feeling extremely overwhelmed and exhausted, you're not alone. As these three examples illustrate, a lot of people are going through this. So I hope that hearing this, you may give yourself permission to consider how am I impacted by the stress of the past few years and before? Because as I've said a thousand times here on the podcast, my stress didn't start in 2020. I was dealing with a lot of grief and trauma throughout 2019. And, you know, I'm, I'm a childhood trauma survivor. I've been dealing with the effects of childhood trauma for about 40 plus years. So I hope if you hear this, you will realize that if you've been struggling, you're not alone. And it doesn't have to be like this. As I just explained, all three of those people did do something to change the situation. The situation itself, what was happening around them wasn't changing. So they changed what they were doing. That's what we always can control, what we do. Pretty much the only thing. So as much as this might sound discouraging or depressing, I hope it doesn't because I'm just speaking about something that is happening. And burnout is, it's a real thing and it can happen to everyone, but there are things we can do to change that. And so that is the message of my guest. And I found it very hopeful when I was speaking with her. My guest, Annie Schusler, helps therapists change the way they work. She helps them create businesses that they can thrive within. Taking the skills that you have and the knowledge and experience that you bring and helping you tap into what does light me up? What feels joyful to me? How do I want to spend my working time? And creating programs that do that. And one of the things that I love about the way Annie teaches, and she came to Trauma Therapist Network and gave a training to our members. So I have seen myself, the way she guides her work, she does it in ways that are not overwhelming. She does it in ways that help you focus in and create something that you can start. It doesn't have to be your whole plan for your whole life, but it's a starting point. Something that you can create that's tangible and get it started and go from there. It's like it's like a little bit of hope. Like when you're in the tunnel, I've been there 
Oh, have I been there. When you're in that dark tunnel and you cannot see any light and you don't even know for sure if it's really a tunnel or if it's just an endless black space, when you begin to see the light there, maybe this, this conversation will give you that. Or if you've already begun to see that there is a light, maybe it'll help you look outside the tunnel and go, oh, what does this different environment look like? Wherever you are, you're not alone. There are many ways that you can be supported and it can get better. If you're feeling burned out, please don't give up. And Maybe this conversation will give you some sparks of inspiration. Annie's going to give a few examples of some of the things that people have who've done her programs have created. And most excitingly, by the time you hear this, her program will be opening up for early access in just a few days. Listen to our conversation and then maybe you will have a new idea. Good luck. Thank you for listening. And... I'll talk to you soon. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm speaking with a very special guest and friend, Annie Schusler. Annie, welcome, and thank you for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you so much, Laura. I am so happy to be with you. Me too, and I'm honored to get to speak with you about your work. And I think that this episode is going to be, well, this conversation is going to be one that I think will resonate for many of us because with the shifts that have been happening culturally over the past two and a half years or so since the beginning of the pandemic and the uprising of 2020 and just so many things that have shaken things up, people are really reevaluating how they want to do things. And I know for so many therapists, on top of, you know, just that like sort of reflection based on maybe focusing more on what's important to you because of the pandemic and all of the things that have been going on or even being at home for a lot of time and having more time to reflect. I think so many people are questioning how they want to move forward in their professions as healthcare providers, helpers, healers, mental health providers, and therapists. And you specialize in helping people really sort of create businesses that really light them up and embrace their gifts. So I'm hoping that we can kind of talk about making those big shifts and maybe you can get our audience thinking about what they want to shift in their lives. Yeah, I'm so excited. I love big shifts. And I also, you know, so I help people create businesses beyond private practice that aren't really under their license necessarily, but maybe a group program or a retreat or something like what you have built, although what you have built is like very robust and not for a beginner, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. And one thing I noticed, so I help a lot of people who have private practices and they want to keep their private practices and add something else. Mm -hmm. And one shift that I notice is that it's not all about let's create this new thing and like that thing will be joyful and perfect and the private practice will stay as it was. That usually people also need to change something in their private practice mm -hmm. at the same time. And so make small shifts as well as big shifts as they're stepping into figuring out like, what's my new way of working? What's my new work life, business life going to look like? So I, I yeah. haven't met anybody in the last couple of years who is just like, yep, my therapy practicing is working as it is. Everybody I know is really needing to step into some shifts to you know, make that business work for them. Yeah. So, and just to be clear, you work with therapists only, or is it, you know, coaches, other body workers, other types of healers and helping professionals as well? It's mostly therapists. But what's been really cool is now that my work centers around working beyond your license, I do end up having people join my groups who are like, there's been a minister who joined, they're often other kinds of healers 
in the mix. Mm -hmm. And I really love that too, because people are really able to learn from each other and to see, okay, here's this completely other way of working. This person didn't start with a therapy license, but it's still probably like 90% psychotherapists. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Because when we get together, we can be very limiting with each other. Oh, no, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do stuff like that. No, yes, that will, that's unethical for us or that other people are allowed to do that, but not us. So yes. it's nice to have a little uh, diversity or perspectives where people go, well, I'm doing this. Yeah. 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 So what, to start with, what are some of the ways that you're seeing people, I guess, taking their clinical skills and passions and making non-clinical side offerings or maybe even separate businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's too big of a question. No, that's beautiful. So, you know, for example, Sonia Brewer is on my mind because I just interviewed her for my podcast. And so she has this beautiful business. She's a psychotherapist and she has this beautiful business where she's got a program for... I hope I get this all, the, use the right words, but go, you know, everybody can look her up and use, get the right words. But it's, oh, it's like highly functioning, over-functioning trauma survivors, and it's called Badass Boundaries. And so it's a program where she is a mentor guiding trauma survivors through a process to create and hold and and live with uh, boundaries that work much better for them. And so being a mentor in this program instead of a therapist, it just gives her this freedom to create this beautiful experience where people can benefit from knowing each other, working with her, and really having like a whole process that wouldn't be possible in the therapy space. Like it's just different. So that's a good example of, you know, someone looking at what do what are the strengths I'm not getting to use in the therapy room? Or what are the ways of being that I want to lean into more? And you're creating a different offering out of that. Well, thank you for that example. And that's so smart because, you know, in a way, trauma seems like, an, I'm going to say niche or niche. People call it both things. Yeah. I always think niche because I speak French, but... <laughs> <laughs> trauma sound like a niche, mm -hmm. but there's so much under trauma. There's relational trauma, there's combat trauma, there's, uh -huh. you know, violence, trauma related to like losing someone to murder and things like that. Yeah. Collective trauma. There's so many. And then those categories have subcategories and subcategories. So when you think about boundaries mm -hmm. and then boundaries for trauma survivors, that's a really specific niche. And I think it's really cool to think about that. Sometimes when we think about doing something additional, it's like it has to be this thing that's everything. And that's so kind of, you could say it's kind of narrow yeah, in a positive way. It's like very specific. I would say that's one of the hardest parts for people in creating. It's you and I talked about how we don't want to say side hustle because we, we want to get away from the hustle, but like another mm -hmm. offering, a side offering, that can be one of the hardest parts for people is niching. And that's what I end up spending a lot of time. One of the things I end up spending a lot of time with people on is going through a process to figure out what their niche is going to be for this offering. And it does bring up so much for people around fears and, you know, fearing that they're going to limit themselves, fearing that they're going to exclude someone fearing they're going to make the wrong choice, we really can, I've been there, like we can really get ourselves into a spiral, worrying about niching and being afraid of niching. And then on the other side of that tends to be a lot of freedom and, you know, getting to really create something that people are looking for and that people can identify as, like you said, it's actually once you, once you narrow it Hey, it's Laura Reagan from Therapy Chat Podcast and Trauma Chat Podcast and Trauma Therapist Network. Coming here to let you know that if you're a trauma therapist or a therapist who 
works with clients who have trauma, even if you don't identify as a trauma therapist, you don't have any certifications, you may not have had formal training in trauma therapy, but you use a trauma focused approach in your work, then I want you to know that trauma therapist network membership is open now for new members. Early access is for people who are on the waiting list and you can join the waiting list now and we'll send you the registration link so you can join at a discounted rate between now and June 19th, 2023. We will be offering a discounted rate that you'll keep for the lifetime of your membership and you can cancel at any time. On the 20th, we're opening up registration to everyone and there will be a discount on your first month, but it's not the same low rate that you will get if you join now. So if this, this is something you've been waiting for, if you need support, you want connection, you enjoy case consultation, you want to learn cutting age neuroscience informed approaches to working with attachment, trauma, and dissociation, then Trauma Therapist Network is a place for you and we would love to welcome you in. There's three tiers of membership. You can learn all about it by going to go.traumatherapistnetwork.com slash join. That will take you to the waiting list. And from there, you can sign up for the waiting list and you'll receive an email with the link to register and that discount code. I hope to see you in the community. Hey, therapists, do you use EMDR in your practice? Well, then you need to know about bilateralstimulation.io. Bilateralstimulation.io is a free and simple tool to provide bilateral stimulation to your EMDR clients. Used by more than 10,000 EMDR therapists worldwide during both telehealth and in-person EMDR sessions, Bilateralstimulation.io provides visual and auditory BLS, and they have remote tactile buzzers you can use to provide tactile BLS over the internet. Yannick, their creator, was an EMDR client himself, and he built bilateralstimulation.io for his own therapist at the beginning of COVID. Now it's used by more than 10,000 EMDR therapists to provide visual, auditory, and tactile BLS to their clients no matter where they are. The basic version of their BLS tool is free, and for therapy chat listeners, bilateralstimulation.io offers an extended two-month trial of their paid version, as well as a special discount on their remote tactile BLS buzzers. Visit bls.software to learn more and claim your benefits by simply typing bls.software into your browser's address bar and hitting enter. Down, it becomes really identifiable, and then that allows people who you built it for to kind of raise their hand and say, oh, they built that for me. So it's worth it, but man, it brings a lot up for people. Yeah. And that point about how stuff comes up for people, I think I think a lot of the decisions we make in business, you know, we always talk about, oh, as therapists, we're not trained to do business or school. And that's true. Yeah. But I think what we don't talk about that often, and I think a lot of coaching overlooks is the real emotional, I guess you could say, resistance that we have. I mean... I don't like using resistance in terms of therapy as like this client is being resistant because they're not ready to explore X, Y, and Z. I don't think of it that way, but but there, there are ways that our defenses can prevent us from being able to see the possibilities. You know, we kind of just get shut down sometimes in those fears or overwhelm. I can really relate to that one. Yeah. So do you work with the emotional stuff for people when they're figuring this out? Or is it more like, you know, don't let that hold you back. Just do this, you know? Mm. <laughs> I do. Probably not that. Not that. But when I, the way I tend to approach it, for one thing, everybody's together in a group. So they're walking through the process step-by-step step together. So you've got a bunch of smart, sensitive compassionate therapists in the room, they do tend to really help each other just in terms of witnessing each other and hearing, like, if I hear you say, gosh, I've got this niche, but I'm really afraid to put it out there. I'm really afraid it will hurt someone else's feelings that it's not 
including them, that kind of thing, then they hear it and they feel like, oh, well, that's totally okay for her to do that. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's okay for me to do that. So a lot of that emotional work happens in just witnessing each other mm-hmm. and supporting each other. And then one thing I do that tends to help a lot of people is I think of it as running an experiment. So I'm really emphasizing all the time, like, we're going to run one experiment with this niche. This is not like marriage. This is like dating. You're trying it on. You're also like helping your future participants try it on. So most people will make adjustments to their niche over time. And so any decision we're making, almost any decision we're making in our business is pretty reversible. So even in making a big shift, I'm always helping people look at it in terms of like, which experiment do you want to try first? And then you might find, yep, that was the one I'm sticking with that. Or you might find "Mm, that didn't fit. So that tends to help people calm their nervous system a little bit and feel like, okay, I can step into this experiment with other people holding my hand and it kind of brings the stakes down a little bit. I can feel that like in my body. It's like I was wrestling with something this morning, as I mentioned to you before we started recording. And I was like, it was like I I got some expert advice about a decision I needed to make. And then after talking with them, then I had to ask. So the first part is like, that's asking for help. My nervous system says, oh, that's a dangerous thing. Don't do it. So I'm I'm building that muscle where I ask for help when I need help. Been building that muscle for like 10 years <laughs> at least. <laughs> but when I talked with them and I was told kind of what some of my options were, then there was a part of me that just was like, I picture it like a child in a crisis running around in circles, just running around like going, oh, yeah, 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 like chicken little. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what my brain was doing. It was like, Got to figure this out. Got to figure something. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, sure. But I, but I also was like, kind of paralyzed with that, because I wasn't really able to do anything. Because all I was doing was kind of frantically coming up with possibilities. So when you talk about trying an experiment, it feels like, for one, it feels like there are multiple possibilities, mm-hmm. and it also feels like you don't have to get it right. It's just an experiment. Yeah. You're just being curious. Yeah. Because it feels like if you're doing this experiment and you're calling it a, this is my plan that you made so hastily when you're in that frantic state, like I was this morning, then you're calling it a plan, but it was really made from this freaking out place. But I will stick with that plan. If I come up with a plan, I go, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'll stick with it. And I will follow that plan through even when it's very obvious that it's not working. And usually it's like not working for me, not for what I'm trying to deliver. That's working, but it's not working for me. And I will just hold on to it. And it's like, I will not allow myself to veer from the plan because this is the plan I made. And I've told everybody this is the plan. And so there's something about like saving faith too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. One thing that tends to help people going through this process of like, you know, launching something new is giving themselves permission, like you said, to ask for help and then also to be somewhat vulnerable in their announcing of their pilot. So like I encourage people instead of saying like, I am an expert on this and I have created my expert offering. I I do want people to like show their awesomeness, but I find that it works better for the people I work with usually to say, hey, I'm really excited about this thing. This is the first time I'm offering it. Will you help me share it? And will you give me your feedback on what you think so far? And and then I can help you share your stuff. And like coming at things with that feeling of like openness and vulnerability, it tends to help to feel like they can be more embodied in the announcement of it and in the like, this is my plan and not as much feel like, this has to work and I'm going to be humiliated if it doesn't. Although 
we still have, you know, we're going to feel feelings if something doesn't work the first time. And that's okay. It's just like what, like opening up some space for what that's going to mean once you've processed the feelings. And then sometimes people hit it out of the park and that's fantastic. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Well, there's something in what you're talking about. There is something about letting go there Mm -hmm. that it's just like, I am, I think, I I don't know. I want to say something about the vulnerability piece too, because it feels very vulnerable to say I'm doing this new thing and will, and it really feels vulnerable to say, will you support it? Or will you help me share about it or spread the word? Yeah. For me, it does. But there's something about the vulnerability. There's two kinds of vulnerability. One is saying, hey, this feels really vulnerable and I love if you would help me. And the other is like feeling really vulnerable, but trying to pretend not to. Yes. I think that's what I do. It's like when I feel vulnerable, it's so vulnerable. Yeah. I'm like, can't go out there like wobbly. I need to act like I believe in this or something. And yeah, but it, there's something about that. Because it keeps me, there's like some way that that blocks me from being open, I think. I don't know. Well, I mean, I really... Not intentionally, but... I totally relate. I remember the first time I offered something on my own, I had done something with like a work wife friend, but the first time I offered something on my own beyond private practice, I, no one signed up, first of all, like just, you know, spoiler alert, zero humans <laughs> signed up and not laughing at you no, but just just spoiler alert it's totally yeah and it's like we can totally laugh at it now oh my gosh at the time it was it felt shameful and embarrassing and it also felt like i was feeling very vulnerable about it but i wasn't asking for help i didn't even tell people about it like i didn't tell anybody yeah. i almost kind of didn't want them to know because what if it didn't work out and I I did some marketing, but I didn't do the kind of marketing that really works well for a first offer, which is relational, like leaning into your relationships and the people who already trust you. I did none of that. And that's, I mean, it wasn't the right offer, but it couldn't have succeeded because I wasn't willing to like ask for help or get vulnerable. So yeah, I completely relate. Like I, I wanted to protect myself. Yeah. It's like you want to give this thing and you feel so much about it. It's almost like it's too precious to share. Mm -hmm. And and so then you unintentionally prevent people from finding it, maybe unconsciously. And then you're like, when no one signs up, you're like, I knew it. This was a bad idea. No one wants what I have to offer. But at least no one knows about it. (laughs) Yeah, at least no one knows that I failed. And then, you know, you tell someone it didn't work out and then they go, I would have signed up for that. I never heard about it. And you're like, then you feel, oh, I didn't do a good job in my marketing. And then you beat yourself up about that. At least this is my process, if anybody's wondering. It doesn't feel too great. Yeah, I think that's part of why I love helping people do sort of like um, a pre-mortem. I mean, that's, I don't know if that's the right word, but like we look at, all right, so what if this doesn't work? Like what if you're like offering a group program for the first time and it doesn't work? People don't sign up. What will that mean? Like let's decide now what that will mean. 
I remember someone recently saying, okay, well, if this doesn't work, like I've niched it pretty well, I've created a really great offer. I care about it. So if this doesn't work, it's time to just say this isn't going to work. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm so <laughs> glad you said that. I'm like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> it's it's just sometimes it needs to happen a few times. Sometimes people need to see like there are early adopters and there are everybody else. And sometimes we need to see an offer a few times before we're ready. And sometimes our colleagues need some time to understand what our offer is. Or sometimes we need like to adjust our messaging a little bit, grow our audience a little bit. But if we can decide ahead of time what quote unquote failure will mean, then I think that can help to not just like take our ball and go home. Yeah. I like that though, though, like, well, what will it mean if this doesn't? Because I think what would happen for myself if I were doing that is I would immediately say all these shame-based things about what it would mean about me. Yeah. And then I would, there would be a part of me that would be like, none of that's true. That's not true. Like as soon as I started to talk about it and think about it, I would go, well, no, that's not really true. Or if somebody else said it, I would definitely be like, no, that's not true about you at all. Exactly. And then that Oh, maybe that's not true about me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's not true about them, then maybe it's not true about me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Could be possible. So that's the thing that you want to do and you're thinking about doing that you maybe almost don't do or you are afraid to try. But what about the things that you do keep doing, you mm-hmm. or me, mm-hmm. us, that aren't working for us and we don't? We just keep doing them because it's status quo. Yeah. How do you help people who are sort of stuck in that space? Yeah. I I mean, I think this is part of why I named my business Rebel Therapist is like trying to help people listen to the little rebellious voice inside that's saying, I don't even think this way I'm working right now is working for me. Like, I think I need to make a change. And so I try to help people give themselves permission to really listen to that and to, you know, I do an exercise with people of pretend that you've burned your therapy license. So like, I'm not going to ever tell someone to actually do it, but just give yourself (laughs) internally. So there's, there you go. Yeah. Cause sometimes we like, it can be the therapy license, it can be income, it can be a lot of different things that where we're like, well, I can't think about that because I, I'm, you know, supporting my family. I'm working with my clients. I have... I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah, I have responsibilities. I can't think about these things. And so I, you know, encourage people to just do a thought experiment of imagining that they had some more freedom and looking at what would they want in that situation or what would they not want anymore. And that often like allows the glimmer to grow a little bit. So I don't think it's about rushing or like most of us don't have the privilege of just taking a huge leap of faith and just saying like, I'm burning my therapy license. I'm starting this other thing. If you do, good for you. But most people can't do that. So it's more like allowing the glimmer to arise and giving that some space and then starting and taking small steps from there. Yeah. Well, I I think one thing I'm seeing is people feeling really, you know, one thing I'm seeing in therapy practices is people feeling really kind of burned out. Yes not wanting to accept insurance anymore because the reimbursements aren't going up in uh, accordance with inflation and they can't support themselves. And the freaking want to see that many clients anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, yes. And then the other thing I'm seeing is people saying, I don't want to do this like medical model therapy anymore, this top-down stuff. It's just not resonating anymore. Yeah. But it's like once you're in that, you feel so trapped in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think both of those things, anything that you're doing and you, it's not working for you, but you feel trapped. Yeah. I guess that's part of the, that holding on to something longer than is really beneficial for us because it, it starts to feel like you can't. Well, that's how it is for me anyway. It's yeah. like, I get just, I get this disempowered feeling and I'm just like, I can't, I can't do that. 
maybe other people can do that, but not me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm thinking of like Tara McMullen's work around, it's like, I never want to step in and say, yes, you can. Like if you can imagine it, And if you believe hard enough, you can make it happen. Like she's done some really great work of showing us like where that kind of thinking came from and why it can be so damaging. So there are really real real reasons why sometimes we can't do things or we can't do things right away. We have to look at like, what is my capacity? And like from a very honest, compassionate place, I love to help people like look at, well, what is possible? What is draining me? right now? And how could I make at least a small shift towards something that would work better? Yeah. And that feels, you know, it's also like the typical coaching thing that gives things kind of almost outrageous screams sometimes, you know, you'll have this and you can be doing this. And, you know, the person who sold you that is maybe doing that because you bought their thing. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the people who are taking it might not have, you know, the time or the luxury of being able to do it all that way yet. But yes. And then that leaves them self-blaming. Like I must not be believing hard enough. Yeah, exactly. I'm in my own way again, you know, and all of that. I know the self-blame thing. So easy to go there. I definitely relate to that too. But then there are like small tweaks we can make that can make big differences that's real power. Yes. What can I do? What do I have the power to change? Mm -hmm. Versus like, let me escape from everything and then do this new fantasy of how everything's going to be. Not that, you know, sometimes huge changes do have to be done. Yeah. But, or can be done. Absolutely. Yeah. But being able to distinguish like what is a should here that I'm holding on to that I could in fact what is a should here that I could actually question and I could actually make a shift around? Well, I think that, and in fact, I know some people who have worked with you and have kind of experienced the, I don't want to overdo it, but like that transformative experience of going from being burned out to having a different way of doing what they're doing and having so much more of a feeling of, rootedness with the work and you know that there's something very resonant about the way you're approaching it so I'm grateful that you took the time to come and talk with us today I wish we had more time maybe we can do a part two sometime yeah thank you so much Laura thank you Annie and can you tell our listeners where they can find more of you and what you're doing yeah so I have a podcast which Laura is a guest on. I don't know if it will have been published before or after this, but look for that. So Rebel Therapist podcast. And then all my stuff is at rebeltherapist.me. Rebeltherapist.me. Got it. Okay. Well, Annie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and bringing your presence to Therapy Chat today. And I I'm eager for the next time that we're going to talk. I know you're coming to my Trauma Therapist Network community actually in a couple of weeks, which is awesome. That will be before this airs, but everyone's very excited about it. So me too. And I'm so grateful to you and I admire your work and you so much. So this is such an honor. Thank you. I feel the same way about you. Bye-bye for now. And everyone listen for the next time that Annie will be back with us again. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached to see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com. Hey, it's Laura Reagan from Therapy Chat Podcast and Trauma Chat Podcast and Trauma Therapist Network. Coming here to let you know 
that if you're a trauma therapist or a therapist who works with clients who have trauma, even if you don't identify as a trauma therapist, you don't have any certifications, you may not have had formal training in trauma therapy, but you use a trauma focused approach in your work, then I want you to know that Trauma Therapist Network membership is open now for new members. Early access is for people who are on the waiting list and you can join the waiting list now and we'll send you the registration link so you can join at a discounted rate between now and June 19th, 2023. We will be offering a discounted rate that you'll keep for the lifetime of your membership and you can cancel at any time. On the 20th, we're opening up registration to everyone and there will be a discount on your first month, but it's not the same low rate that you will get if you join now. So if this, this is something you've been waiting for, if you need support, you want connection, you enjoy case consultation, you want to learn cutting age neuroscience informed approaches to working with attachment, trauma, and dissociation, then Trauma Therapist Network is a place for you and we would love to welcome you in. There's three tiers of membership. You can learn all about it by going to go.traumatherapistnetwork.com slash join. That will take you to the waiting list. And from there, you can sign up for the waiting list and you'll receive an email with the link to register and that discount code. I hope to see you in the community.